Tomoya to Tokyo and Kyoto. I've known Bob for a long time, and I've known his dedication to the profession of landscape architecture. And in my humble opinion, he epitomizes me the advanced thought and thinking of this particular discipline of physical design. And I think that we are very fortunate to have him here this evening to talk on the topic of environmental design. Bob? Can you turn the lights out on the mic? Thank you. What would these Monday evening lectures be without the cocktail party beforehand and the inflated introduction after? I'm, I'm going to try a couple of things tonight, if you will, and, and several of them are highly personal. I'm also getting old and I can't see as well as I used to be able to. I have a feeling about the physical environment that I'm offended is seemingly a personal one. I have a feeling about the environment that seems to be shared by the people who live in the world and not the people who design for the people who live in the world. And that's what offends me about what I see and, and what I sense is happening as we operate professionally. The, the created landscape of structure, the created landscape of, of an external architecture just simply don't add up to what I think of and experience as, as the environment. And as a landscape architect, as I look at communities, uh, I find a, a persistent, constant, immutable physiology of how a landscape grows into a community, and how that community grows toward quality. And I find this on a global basis, and I will attempt a bit to illustrate it uh, to you tonight through that those few places that I have had an opportunity to visit. And I think that the entirety and the substance and the beginning of the physiology of the environment begins obviously, clearly, no place else but in nature. The natural landscape is a is a cyclical, regenerative thing. It's alive, it grows. It affects that delightful characteristic of permanence through change, rhythmic, regenerative, time-related, seasonally, daily, botanically, geologically, the landscape dies and is reborn. The built landscape of buildings and pavements gets older and older according to historical time. I've got a friend, uh, the architectural heretic, a fellow named Malcolm Wells. You might have seen some of his articles in PA form and magazines like that. Uh, he's called the underground architect. Uh, a brilliant man, really. And, and Malcolm told me one time that something that I have never forgotten. Uh, he reminded me, perhaps, that the landscape left alone never grows into a parking lot. The landscape left alone does grow, and it grows into a very predictable cycle and rhythm of things that, that reach a crescendo and a climax, uh, and then degenerate and collapse only to begin again. And, and the landscape in its natural state is a constantly changing, constantly permanent place because it is constantly changing. The human significance of this kind of thing, this regenerative versus historic time, lies in the relationship of one to the other. And in the fact that some of you are dealing with one of these time frames and others of us are dealing with another, and the fact that we really don't understand each other uh, in, across many facets of our mutual professional engagements, but particularly, I think, or beginning with this facet, that we don't understand time. 
The energy relationship between natural place, urban form, and vitality is what I'd like to talk about and attempt to illustrate. In the capacity of nature to switch time from historical degenerative time to regenerative cyclical time. Now the natural landscape is the prime structure of a place. It is the place. It is the essence of why it's there and what it is and what characteristics it has before it begins to be a developed place. The prime structure of a place at any scale, regional scale, your little backyard, is first of all a natural place, first of all a natural composition. Uh, and, and it has this composition, it has this structural framework, even as we urbanize it, and unfortunately all too often obliterate it. And these persistent things in the natural landscape that persist in the face of all of our efforts to, neglect, to deny them, this, uh, these features, these slopes, uh, these hills, these vistas, these drainage ways, these tender tissues of a functioning physiology. These all persist in the face of urbanization and must be recognized by us, or we have changed that place from what it was and what it might have become to something that has only our ego to sustain it, and something that becomes an oddly uh, strange alien place even as we inhabit it. The, the source of uniqueness in the designed environment is in the uniqueness of the natural environment. How simple that is. I sat last year, year and a half ago in Hong Kong, and I, I'll show you a couple of slides of Hong Kong. I was overwhelmed by Hong Kong. And I was up on the top of a hill in the hotel, and, and uh, looking down over over the harbor, listening to some people at a table next to me talking about a uh, uh, tiger hunt they had just come back from in India. The, the uh, fantastic uh, romantic glamour of that kind of company. And I had flown into Hong Kong that afternoon and, and I was near tears in the plane looking at the most spectacular goddamn place I have ever seen in all my life. And it occurred to me as I sat up on top of this hotel that there could be no other place like Hong Kong. And there is a uniqueness to place like there is uniqueness to a fingerprint. And all places that grow to quality are places whose uniqueness has been recognized and reinforced by the people who settle there and allow that thing to continue and to be celebrated and to be constantly there even as it is changed through urbanization. That's the whole trick of environmental design. To keep what you have even as you change it because you understand what it is. When you take the, the conservancies, the stimulating diversities of the unique fingerprints that are the natural elements, the trace of a place. And when you couple these things with the constructed place and open space of parks and plazas and squares and, and the human feature, you have the opportunity to collectively pattern urban growth, to relate new form energies to the continuing energies of existing form. All that which causes what is continues to be exerted against the place. And if we recognize all those formative, causative energies, then we join the energies rather than obliterating them, but still they are immutable and they will not go away. You can express the energy uh, relationship of, uh, of a freight train by standing alongside and watching it go by or you can express the energy of a freight train by standing right in front of it and it'll wipe you out. It hurts a lot, smart. Or you can express that same energy by jumping on that train and being carried along with it. And that's the, the relationship that we ought to have to the natural energies that continue to be expressed even as we so typically and so horribly uh, ignore the natural, continuing, forceful, identifiable, valuable elements of the natural place.
one of the things that I think is uh, a phenomena of place recognized is that when we have derived the substance of our community from recognition of its natural frame, we find a permanence of community vitality in the face of ethical changes over uh, historical time, a constant regeneration of place in place. We find a stability of property values. And if you think of the towns that you're from, if you think of the places that you've been, if you have a long-term association with them, or if they are old enough to be worth studying, then I think you'll find that the there is a gravitational pull toward those open space natural conservancies of place, that which was the causative element of that community existing in the first place. And there is a regeneration and a constant recycling of the constructed values and artifacts, the architecture of the community, in association with that open space. Uh, I can think of, uh, of the natural pull of the Charles River in Boston. Um, and how through long periods of trial and error, that open space, that tender drainage tissue now has been conserved through the Fenway, through Olmsted, through later planners, how uh, institutions have gravitated toward that tissue of the place called Cambridge and Boston, uh, and how uh, Bunker, the Beacon Hill, how that entire hill has been uh, a Georgetown-like, uh, uh, resurrected over and over and continues to maintain the value that it had when it was original. It isn't really any different now than it was when it was original. It's still there. It's still the hill. Conversely, South Bay, the, the original site of the city of Boston, Back Bay, has been filled in. There is no more blighted area in the city of Boston than Back Bay. I think of a uh, of a similar situation in a dozen cities around the world in, in uh, all too frequent uh, instances of this type in, in our country, in which the denial of the natural trace elements of a place are those areas of the place that are blighted and negative and constantly going downhill. And we can urban renewal these places until doomsday and we'll never save them until we recognize the whole structure that should guide the growth and development of a community. Community uh, growth out of context with nature, with the landscape frame of the place, has a, a sort of a silly, superficial, senseless lack of identity. Uh, and the, the physiologic problems of, uh, of a community grown out of the context of the, of the capabilities of its natural infrastructure. You know, a place is just so big, and a place should get to be just as big as it is, and it shouldn't get any larger. Uh, it, the frame of a place initiates its, its basic pattern of circulation. How do you get from here to here, here to there in a place? But according to the, the patterns and the extended elements of the drainage ways of that place, according to the gradient of that place, the sense of gravity of that place, you get a constant, uh, continuing contact with that which has been before. You get a time dimension when you relate your community to its natural feature. And you get image and edge and location and proportion. And you get something to guide the human judgments made as to what should be where and how much of it you should have. The frame provides for a community of uh, transcendent form, a geometry of the logarithmic spiral, a very misunderstood geometry, a geometry that is violated by the idiocy of the straight line, but the geometry of the logarithmic spiral. The frame of a place is the garden of that place. It's the utopia, it's the thing we're looking for, it's the reason that we cross oceans, it's the reason that we travel. It's the place that makes us feel safe and secure and free from fear. This is the place that everybody's looking for. This garden search motivates people to, uh, to irrigate deserts, uh, to build new towns, to put up new buildings, to, uh, to uh, run to places like suburbs. 
and it suggests uh, roots, death, time continuing. And it's reinforced, obviously, by association, by, uh, by the art and architecture that celebrate it, that reinforce it, that make no sense without it, by history made visible in place by human activity. And so we have environmental design. This is really what we're about. But you can't do it with architecture on one hand and outside architecture on the other hand. It doesn't grow that way. That's not physiologic. That's not how it happens. That's not how it's happened for 5,000 years. And that isn't how it's going to happen from this point on. We're going to have different kinds of communities, vastly different kinds of communities, but they'll have the characteristics that communities have always had unless we change our characteristics. That's the kind of thing that uh, I find so simple, and, and yet I find so few uh, good examples of it here to tell you about. And I bore people with a constant uh, reference of, uh, of analogy to uh, someplace else in the world. Uh, we just don't seem to be old enough and deep enough to understand. Uh, environments, if we compose them this way, truly illustrate our purpose as professionals. And they celebrate place, they celebrate the culture, they incorporate the ceremony of those cultures, and they incorporate and recognize the rhythm of those cultures. Uh, I'll have opportunity in the slides uh, to talk perhaps about rhythm. I was talking about it at dinner time. There is a there is a, a number of dimensions to environment that we don't seem to be able to uh, to respond to in this country, and it's a shame that we don't because they uh, they make me feel, having experienced them, that there is no such thing as environment without having tuned into the sensation of these dimensions. I was telling one beautiful lady about an experience I had in Munich a couple of years ago, and it was a rainy night like tonight, and I was came down out of my hotel to the Marion Plots and, and I walked past a, a, a church that I'll show you a slide of. And, and that church goes a thousand feet in the air. And, uh, it's got a twin uh, onion-like domes. You probably recognize it if you've seen pictures of Munich. And just as I walked past this huge and somber thing, the, the bells sounded midnight. A fantastic dimension to the environment that I could no more recreate in your minds. You must go there and hear that. You must hear the sound of history and respond to it as designers. You must sit in the cafes. You must respond to the rhythm of the Spanish people in Spain. You must sense the different rhythm in Chicago and New York and Detroit and San Francisco. You must incorporate the guts rhythm of people in place as significantly as you must sensitize yourselves to the guts dynamic demanding rhythm of the nature of a place that you presume to design for. The experience of environments so composed and the experience of environments that have been so composed is a complex experience. There's nothing valuable about simplicity, and we seek it so much. Simplicity is ludicrous. Simplicity is separate parts. And environments that are composed in a physiological fashion are complicated, deep, powerful things. They're comprehensive places. And people have a comprehensive response to the totality of the place. It's not just a neighborhood. They use the entire city. They have a sense of entirety. And they have a sense of their being in relationship to the entire place. Not just the uh, West Tulsa or the South Side of Chicago, but all of Chicago is incorporated by people who live in older environments. There are dimensions that grow that we don't really seem to be able to understand. But they're incipient in our culture, and we ought to be looking for them. 
we ought to be characterizing them and reinforcing those characteristics and bringing it out into the open and building an environment here in this country which we are not even beginning yet to do. I find environments in, in older cities, uh, environments in Montreal, environments in Boston, some of the environments in, uh, in a place like San Francisco, uh, I find them clearly to be complex and comprehensive, I find them to be integrated, I find them to be generalized, and I find them most of all to be pedestrian, to be microspatial. And throughout the historical periods of these environments, there are slices cut through, like Hausmann cut through Paris, in which the environment is institutional and it immediately turns to macrospatial. And that's an accepted part of the culture of that place. And you accept the institutionalized environment in a very different way than you accept the personalized environment of your pedestrian and residential place. There is another environment that is quickly expansive and macrospatial, and that's the aristocratic environment. And in many uh, uh, foreign cultures, the aristocratic and the institutional are, are really one and the same. Then we have the bureaucratic environment, which again shifts scale from the pedestrian and the intimate to the expansive and macrospatial. And then we have the egomaniacal environment, which is a fractured, expansive, macrospatial environment. How tragic that is that we have such an environment. How tragic it is that you have such an environment here. How tragic it is that we misunderstand the expansiveness of and the spaciousness of this land we live in to feel that therefore we must spread everything out in a in a inhuman uh, dimension between its parts. And this fractured egomaniacal constant series of separate entities in which we begin the design of an environment with each structure and each commission is an idiotic waste of time and we continue to spend our lives with this kind of an idiotic waste of time we are constantly starting all over in the design of an environment and of course if you have a conceptual sense that you can start the design of an environment you're already lit if you have a sense that you can start all over in designing an environment, you have a chance to design an environment. Most of the things that you need to work with when you're designing the environment are already there. The whole key to understanding environmental design is that it's already there. There are thousands, millions of things to respond to in the pre-existing environment, in the environment that's there before there is any construction, and then in all of the constructions of that environment that we respond to in a purposeful and compositional and complicated way. And if you're not designing that way, then you're playing a, a, a game supported by your ego, but it has very little to do with, with what has been done for some thousands of years. And I don't see it growing any place, and I don't see it adding up to anything. I see our job as designers one in which we respond to discipline the discipline, obviously, of culture, but that cultural discipline as ordered by place, by frame, by the natural structure, by the sun and the wind and the topography, by the climate, by all that which already is. Design expressive of what wants to be discovered. Design uh, that is post-eroded. Design that has thought through what wants to be and starts at that point of what wants to be. Uh, post-eroded, line of least resistance design, but not simple one-to-one -one primitive level design. Uh, you, you have to go to the gut issues one-to-one, -one, and then you've got to elevate those gut issues to a shared collective sense, uh, to the uh, extra-personal discipline of the culture, extra-personal discipline of decision, extra-personal discipline of plan an extra-personal uh, awareness of the fact that the pre-existing environment has already determined 99% of what you need to know about that place. But you need to know that it does that. Let's take a look at some slides, and uh, I'm gonna work a sandwich deal here. Uh, these few comments, these some slides, and, and then some closing comments, and uh, apparently there will be 
uh, if necessary, uh, or, or if it's generated an opportunity to uh, uh, ask and answer some questions. Now, if I can get myself electronically worked up here. Says one or the other. I thought I'd start with this slide. It's not a good one, uh, but it uh, it gives me the opportunity uh, and, and you the opportunity for the, the value of instant recognition. That roof line, that water, uh, you just know you're in Holland. Uh, what would you use to identify Munster? <laughs> You people just have to give up your cars. This kind of thing, uh, this is again in Amsterdam. Uh, it's just so natural that, that there are multiple uh, commercial activities happening uh, in the context of parks, in the context of residentiality. Uh, that there, there's a vitality, a real life, lots of activities occurring in the same place. Uh, this sort of thing occurring uh, uh, on the street down by the town, the, the, uh, the incident of, of love, an incident of respect uh, for whoever this old guy was, uh, the fact that he's there means he'll never go away. Uh, I like to stand by him and, and just touch him and appreciate what sculpture is all about. This right in the heart of, uh, of Amsterdam. There are no activities that occur here that don't occur all in the same place. Uh, this is not a segregated, uh, cut up, uh, discrete separation of parts. This is everything happening all at once. This is not uh, uh, the, the, the response pattern that we'll get by the lunacy of our zoning. Uh, this is a real city. It's working here. The physiology is evident. Uh, and the city began right here. And the Zyder Z was right at this spot. And that's what a city is all about. And, and this is just uh, 15, 20 minutes away, outside of the frame of Amsterdam, uh, just a, 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 a sort of a contemporary extension of Amsterdam out by the airport. Uh, a quick shift of scale, expansive, barren, stupid. It's going to take generations by trial and error to get this thing back into shape. How tragic that uh, one could make such an error uh, in the context of such brilliant examples. This is still Amsterdam. Uh, the, the richness, the complexity, the, uh, the common sense, the practicality. Uh, that pavement pattern is something uh, all the utilities are under the sidewalks. Uh, all the sidewalks can be just lifted out. The, or the, or the utility cuts uh, are repaired, uh, no problem. These just little, little uh, one-foot square blocks of pavement. We have uh, arrogantly supercilious uh, concrete grid that we cover everything with, this rigid uh, concrete mat. Then we have to break it up, and of course you can never match it again, and we have a fractured stupid sense of environment. The Dutch, of course, uh, have two unstable soil conditions uh, to bother with such idiocies. Must be Holland. How informative the vertical is. Uh, how st clearly structured this flat landscape is. How intimate, how detailed, how precise, how active. This is in Antwerp. Uh, yeah, I'm sure uh, you've seen this in your art history slides. Uh, I, I like uh, this kind of illustration of composition, of respect. Uh, these buildings built uh, quite separate from each other in time. Uh, and how loving each is of the other's existence, and how how we would see that as an opportunity to take issue with that whole thing, to miss the compositional point, uh, and to clearly identify some 
diversion from this fabric that all must commit to, this collective fabric that all must commit to, uh, and each must reinforce. Just Dover, just a silly white cliff, uh, and, and known all over the world. The, the identifying characteristic of a natural feature uh, here so large that uh, they couldn't be destroyed. But uh, how, how, what carrying power there is to a natural feature, even as simple as, as these white cliffs of Dover. People can take exception with this, but I, I, I put this shot in just because it is so obviously ceremonial. The, uh, uh, the delight of re-engaging and illustrating and making publicly visible uh, the seams of the culture and the seams of history, uh, how you make it available to more people more frequently and reinforce your own sense of yourself. Uh, it seems to be a characteristic that we share the least amount. And this, uh, this respectful uh, holding back uh, in the airspace uh, around Big Ben, uh, whether it's an accidental shot or not, I don't know. I, I, I like the, the, yes, the clarity and the openness. And of course, all of these parliament buildings all along the frame of London uh, that linear water frame of London. And this is a, a shot in one of the large parks in London. Uh, and, I, and I was beginning to understand at this point how lacking this park was in the Puritan ethic. Uh, and, and it began a whole stream of consciousness in, in my own head and and, uh, and I delighted in this little restaurant that had uh, the multiple kinds of facilities and whatnot but the fact that it was in a park I found astounding an American in London uh, we have a, a negative attitude toward parks a sort of a silly attitude uh, uh, do not walk do not cross do not this do not that and and we provide no facilities and and, and in most other cultures parks are places for facilities and they're expected to be there and are. This is the uh, that kind of thing. It had eight or nine different price levels and whatnot. Uh, we, we have wars that go on for 20 years about a restaurant in Central Park in New York City. Uh, this again, just skipping quickly, uh, a village in, in southern England, Salisbury. Uh, the the, uh, the delight of of the hotel, the inn, you know, being the thing that is identified. Everything else can be played way down. There is no need to identify except for the traveler. Everybody else knows uh, where the bakery shop is and, and what other else is going on. And again, that, that, uh, that composition, tremendous variety and diversity, but that composition one structure with respect to the other. Oh, just a little fun with Stonehenge. just a uh, sense of the intimacy of the scale of the British landscape. And if you, if you let that rattle around in your head a little bit, you, you, you can get an insight into the British character, into the British practices, by having a sense of the intimacy of the scale of their landscapes. And how, um, how, how delightful are the opportunities to celebrate uh, those gateways and those control points uh, it's a gracious, uh, uh, out of the context of our history, of course, but a, an incident that deserves to be recognized. You are entering. There is a need for invitation, uh, and it's clearly established here. Uh, stricture, opening, uh, spatial play, all woven into the fabric of their history. It's just a street in Paris. Great, a very clever thing. It's been used in Paris for 150 years. 
concentrically there are weakened points and as the tree grows the uh, the grade is just broken in a wider and wider circle fantastically urbane uh, silly little trinket that is uh, identical to the elegance and eloquence of Paris this this uh, bench is in a similar way this bench is Paris how urban this bench is how elegant how aristocratic how supremely sensible this is, how opportunistic it is. You can't do better than that. We can do a lot worse and, and persist in doing a lot worse. The constant celebration, the rich, baroque, constant celebration. The celebration of uh, the relief from compression, the elongation of the same, uh, the pedestrian ways along it, the uh, opportunities to sit on the bridges, the, the expansive uh, uh, association with nature. Uh, this is, is replicated all over the world, appreciation for waterways. The Tuileries. Uh, I don't know, maybe you've heard about the Tuileries. I find it one of the most delightful places in the world. It really isn't anything but a bunch of sand and clay and some children's merry-go-rounds, uh, some scattered trees, some benches that cost you a few centimes as soon as you sit down. Uh, very little of the path, just an open, free, meandering, informal place decorated for children and replete in the summertime especially with with carousel opportunities and gaiety and color. Always uh, there are thousands of people in the, in the Twitter. How uh, complex is that simplicity? There's a building you want to recognize, the UNESCO building. That Nogachi, uh, I think that the staircase did a, did a garden, a Japanese garden, sort of a silly thing to have in Paris. And a more, but more importantly, the, the skyline of Paris, uh, that delicate uh, blue-gray, the mansard roof, the, uh, uh, the street tree, the constant presence of street trees, uh, and then that three, four-story background that, that characterizes 99% of Paris and is presently being raped by the stupidity of 30 and 40 story towers. Uh, what, a, what, a, what a precious world resource the skyline of Paris was until the arrogance of a couple of years ago. Ah, this expansive. Now here's the, the institutional aristocratic scale of Paris, the uh, 700 foot wide street, uh, Houseman's Paris, Louis Paris. A fantastic street, an animated street, uh, a street that responds to the sun conditions of the orientation of the street's exposure. All the cafes on one side, all the airline terminals and non-sun related things on the other side. Now, uh, just quickly some macro landscape. Uh, uh, this is uh, central and southern France. Just heading south towards Spain. <coughs> I flew over this just last week and, uh, and I looked down uh, sort of anticipating what I knew I'd see because I looked down on it before and uh, out of the plane window uh, in any direction you could see perhaps a dozen villages. Each village uh, separated by the distance of two farms and and what I was looking at was not villages so much as the culture of that part of France expressed on its landscape, the, the cultural engagement with its landscape. And I noticed a similar thing uh, in Italy, in the Italian hill country. Uh, uh, each defensive hill town, two farms apart. Uh, live in town, walk out to the farm during the day, walk back at night. Uh, and, and this portion of France is uh, very much like that. Uh, you really don't look at the community as much as you look at the culture. You're seeing in between the lines, and it's a very informative thing. 
the, the towns themselves are tight and compressive. And in, in very few minutes flying time, uh, the Pyrenees are, uh, are some of the most rugged little mountains, but they take just a few minutes to fly over. And just as soon as you get on the other side, then it begins immediately to turn brown. Uh, the whole sense of landscape changes. Uh, and as you look down on this high central plateau, if you see a village at all, uh, you may see one. The mood and the scale to this place. It's one of the most romantic things. Uh, on a sunny day, there is a quality to Spanish light that I've never seen any place else. It, it, it just doesn't shine on you. It sort of absorbs you. A, a beautiful golden light. I drove up from uh, Malaga uh, just last week, and, and uh, that's the very mountainous coast, southern coast of Spain. And when you, when you break over the top of the mountains, you enter a, a, a plateau similar to this, and Granada is up on that high plateau. And, and that milky uh, golden sun was there. Uh, I was pleased to be back in Spain. An interesting thing about the, uh, uh, this dramatically expansive landscape is that the urban form is similarly compressive to the urban form uh, in a very different landscape just on the other side of the Pyrenees. Uh, something interesting in that phenomenon. Here is urban form as you might express, uh, as, as you might express it in, in a very primitive, uh, this is an occupied village. It's a very primitive one-to-one -one expression, but it reaches past that one-to-one. -one. It reaches toward a collective, extra-personal kind of thing uh, through the fact and placement and, and dominant position of the church. There's something valuable in reaching outside of yourself, something valuable in environmentally expressing your culture constantly to make it visible, constantly to celebrate it. Uh, Retiro Park in the center of Madrid. Uh, these are very expensive trees. Each one of these trees in that little saucer that you can see, each tree watered once a day. And they can't afford the water to do that, but they can't afford to lose the trees. Uh, sort of silly Madrid. Madrid is not much of a city. It's hardly a Spanish city. This kind of stupidity. Ah, the Plata Mayor in Madrid. There, uh, this is a, a, a large square plaza. Uh, it's a constant arcaded structure all the way around. Constant shade and shops in the shade. Uh, we think we invented the shopping center. Uh, views like this that break out of the arcaded uh, surround of the Plata Mayor. As long as we're in Madrid, we might go to a bullfight. This is the uh, very, very typical uh, approaching the southern mountains of Spain. Constant uh, olive groves. This is in the, the uh, Sierra Nevadas. Uh, this you might be interested in is a, uh, I was there in association with some work I was doing for the College of Forestry uh, and, and we were doing for the Spanish government. This is a national forest, a bit different from our national forest. Uh, Granada from the Alhambra. Uh, in the far distance, uh, just below the brow of the hill, is the Gypsy uh, Cave Village. Uh, I, I, I look at that and, and include it here only to go back again to this one-to-one -one environment. An environment is not simply a response to the pressures that want to cause it. Not simply that, not that at a primitive level, but that at least and then elevate it to some collective community sense of purpose. And you see a thing like those gypsy caves uh, 
is just simply one to one. It's a teepee village, pick them up, take them away. It's a transient, it doesn't build a civilization, it doesn't build an environment. I'm going backwards, excuse me. Uh, up on the Alhambra. I know you've all seen these things. Beautiful scale in this courtyard. Uh, you you walk around either at the courtyard level or or at the second floor on the balcony level, and the sound of that water uh, is so necessary in July. Uh, such a sensual environment. Moorish, of course, until 1492 when they were kicked out. Now this, I, I think you've also seen these pictures. Uh, this balustrade and, and railing as you walk up and down uh, these steps uh, makes me think of love when I see this picture. You had to love someone to want to handle them so specially in the hot weather of southern Spain. You had to love people to design a thing like this. You had to love them enough to want to cool them. And I don't see that kind of intimate sensitivity. Uh, and, and I don't see any reason why we don't have that kind of intimate sensitivity. I'll show you other uh, similar situations in which love had to be the motivating force for the designer's efforts. This is just simply characteristic of that coast of Spain, mountains right down to the sea, very shallow shelf. fishing village of Almunacre. <laughs> I took these pictures uh, a couple of years ago and I was there just last week and it's really strange to uh, to realize that, that this entire beach where those shacks are is uh, all lined with hotels now in just five years. Uh, at the far end of that beach going up that hillside uh, is what's called the Barrios. It was a uh, Spanish government uh, housing uh, provided for these these uh, simple fishermen. That uh, that beach is a pebble beach, and uh, I had some difficulty uh, swimming there. And the surf is two or three feet, and as you walk out into the surf. Uh, the pebbles drop out as the waves break and really pound your shin something fierce. Uh, there is a sound associated with as those pebbles drop out as the velocity breaks and the wave breaks. And I'll carry that sound like I carry that sound of the church bells in Munich. Sounds are part of the place. And I've not heard that sound and don't care to hear that sound any place else in the world. We have a sense of beach, I think, in this country that is pure white sand, and it's it's a very unique thing, only I don't think we realize how unique it is. And uh, uh, this is much more typical of the European beach, uh, certainly the Spanish, uh, except for protected little coves. And uh, this, this, this kind of pebble uh, thing continues uh, even uh, up along the French uh, Riviera. Uh, can you imagine a, a more delightful marriage of architecture to place? You know, where is the cliff and where are the structures? This is uh, a village that I don't know the name of. Uh, I just drove past this. This is in the the uh, southeastern corner of Spain, uh, around Almeria, heading north toward Murcia, Valencia, and Barcelona. I think this is architecture, vernacular, peasant, but truly architecture. Ah, Barcelona. <sighs> It, it, it's, it's hard 
to believe in a gothic city like that. And it's hard to believe, uh, knowing the gothic as you do, how the power of what is gothic could be superseded by one individual, albeit a genius. How much personal identification there is with an architectural style that uh, had so much carry to it, and how simply and quickly he personalized it, even as he kept it gothic. There are uh, two more major towers that have just been completed. God, that's genius work. Uh, Gaudi has several other structures in, uh, in Barcelona. And this perhaps will be finished in another hundred years or so. This is a building they call the Stone Pile. Do you recognize this? Uh, a turn of the century building. It's stone, not concrete. It looks like concrete. Uh, th those balconies are, uh, are sculptured steel. And, and of course, uh, this celebrates and romanticizes the, uh, the use of steel in, in the structures. Uh, just a great building. A great resource to have in a community. Uh, and even though the Barcelonans uh, kid the building, they, they really, truly love it. Just across the street is another uh, shop and apartment uh, that's even more effervescent in this inimitable style of God. <laughs> it just makes you laugh. It makes you pleased. And, and that's, of course, what it was uh, intending to do. Yet it joins and celebrates the buildings that are with it in a compositional whole, even as unique and powerfully individual as it is. This is more of Gaudi, a park up on top of uh, Barcelona, looking way back down over the harbor. This again, uh, to my recollection, turn of the century. Uh, he he uh, really didn't design facilities in that park so much as he designed the park into the park. He designed play and gaiety and fun into the park. And it's a, it's a very, very successful place. Just a shot on the coast of Brahma. Monte Carlo. Again, Monte Carlo. The, uh, the frame of this slope down to the Mediterranean just being uh, uh, absorbing and assimilating uh, this tremendously dense construction of Monte Carlo. All really one and the same thing. Compositionally, I don't know as there is a more perfect place in the world than Portofino. It's just an organic thing, this beautiful Portofino. And again, the culture of the place is visible in place. That, uh, that simple fishing village with that church tower rising above it, the, uh, the reality to that kind of composition, the respect and the, the opportunity to reinforce what was already a delightful natural place by the architecture of the place. And how, uh, how nicely they accommodated the uh, use of the discontinuous line, uh, incorporating it into the, the uh, continuous, the logarithmic spiral of that curve as it works a red way around the harbor. That's no mean trick. Just a simple little fishing village. Now, <clears throat> this is the uh, Arno in Florence. Uh, again, uh, on the Ponte Vecchio here. And uh, if you've been to Florence and you know the compression of the city, uh, how delightful it is to walk out on the Ponte Vecchio and, uh, and celebrate the linearity of the Arno and the wind conditions and the, the opportunity for your eyes to see great distances. Uh, 
how humane are these kind of urban discoveries made hundreds and, and uh, thousands of years ago. Uh, until the war, the, uh, each, each bridge had uh, a development of that type that celebrated the opportunity to be out over the river. That's the Ponte Vecchio looking back uh, in the center of that slide. The unity, the compositional totality of Florence. And the Piazza Michelangelo. Tivoli, you can throw your coins in here. Here's where it all began. This is Tivoli, uh, uh, outside of Rome, uh, the site uh, some of you perhaps remember as the site of the Villa d'Este. Uh, I find it hard to distinguish here, and in so many uh, situations like this of hill towns between mountain and town. <laughs> this is Assisi, uh, north of here in the hill country. How, how uh, how purposeful uh, that defensive town is, how strongly assertive that is as you come out to the brow of the hill and the church establishes its position in that place. Boy, that's powerful. That's great. I, uh, I really love Assisi. And, uh, oh, I'm switching carousels now. This, uh, this technique I, uh, you know, I find refreshing and delightful. It's, it's so uh, compressive up there on top of the hill. And uh, there are these breaks of three and four or five feet wide. And then you get this sweeping panoramic view of the valley. And that doesn't happen uh, all too often. And it's very, very necessary. Uh, again, I, I'm struck by how humane these kinds of places are. Uh, how organic their compositional massings are. Uh, arrived at uh, more naturally and uh, more accidentally, more humanly, just by a family addition. It's a little village of uh, Hellkirk, I think it is, in uh, Austria, just going into Switzerland. Uh, an arcaded village, much like the uh, Plata Mayor in, in Spain. And, uh, You, you find a lot of these design similarities on a north-south basis. And this village functions all the time. Uh, it's cool in there in the summertime, and it's out of the snow in the wintertime, and you don't even have to shovel the sidewalk. How clever this little village is. Uh, this is just a couple of shots of, uh, of Munich, uh, the Olympic site. You must all have seen these things. I, uh, I was struck by the uh, the organic feel to this place. How differently we would do this job. Uh, how very German it is. It's really quite a nice job. constant reinforcement of what the culture is, what its values are, uh, the, uh, the control over the river crossing, and the celebration of that control. And again, this fit, the, the environmental simplicity and ease of that fit, 
between community and river circulatory pattern. It's all really the same thing. You've all seen this, obviously. I, uh, it's, it, there is a lesson to me here in the fact that this is the way we always see this statue. And, uh, and you get a sense that it's out in the middle of the harbor. And it is so very Danish to have it right here. Uh, it, there's, there's a much greater measure of the light and some betrayal of our own suspicions when we find this thing able to be uh, reached by children and associated uh, in a direct, intimate way with children. And of course, uh, what other purpose should it have? Uh, this is City Hall and a reflection of that in, in the garden in Tivoli. Uh, and I want to put that in to show you how close together they are and how, how delightful it is that this kind of thing can be within reflection distance of the City Hall. It's hard to decide whether this Tivoli is a, a city or a park, and it should be hard to decide those kind of questions. And there shouldn't be this kind of silly cleavage that we insist upon between the two. In fact, a well-designed city shouldn't need a park. And it ought to be an anachronism that eventually fades out of our sense of urban design. <laughs> to sit there and listen to the music. There's often a kind of cleverness that, uh, that it may make detailed sense to point out. Uh, we take growing things quite often and attempt to make them fit our sense of what form they ought to take and topiary and other uh, passing fancies grow out of that attitude toward the growing thing. And here, uh, it just happened in, in Copenhagen, and I passed down this street, and asked my children to sit there for a while while I took a shot of this ivy growing on wire frames. And the ivy wants to grow wherever the frame is, and the frame wants to be rectilinear because it's in the urban area. So that you get sort of a rectilinear platform uh, but you get it in union with the expression of its energy rather than by power exerted against the expression of its energy in topiary. I think there's a lesson in that kind of thing. And, and the clever uh, Danish designers obviously understand that lesson. Then there is a lesson in this. Uh, I showed you a slide of, of the Moorish uh, expression of love in that stairway insipid cruelty to have people live in a place like this. Ah, that was just a stop on the way to Tokyo. Tokyo is equally incredible, maybe not much more meaningful. It's not like uh, uh, all mystical and eastern and uh, glamorous to me. But uh, a sort of a big city having reached the scale that it did. Tokyo was built on a on a swamp uh, with the meandering streams through that swamp and it was developed uh, as the capital city of Japan because the population pressures were were uh, ruining Kyoto. Kyoto had been the capital for 1400 years and then it was just arbitrarily and summarily moved to this swamp uh, called Tokyo. And, and for a long time, in the early history of Tokyo, it made sense. And each river crossing became the settlement. And each settlement took its name from the river crossing. And the districts of Tokyo today still carry the name of those river crossings. But Tokyo has just grown too much. And it's grown all out of all proportion. And Tokyo is just fantastically mixed with little tiny original residences and 30-story office towers, a wild place. Uh, the Japanese uh, 
tragically have no sense of urban design. And they borrow in an eclectic, random effort from every country and every style, and one of these and one of those and one of something else. No sense here in a, in a country that you have uh, a feeling is so sensitive to things environmental. No sense of composition. No sense of how to handle this brand new thing called urban design. Just can't hack it. It's an offensive place. And, and it's so heavily polluted that you can only be outdoors for a few hours and, uh, and still see. This is the river crossing that, uh, that uh, a number of these characterized, the village concentrations characterized early Tokyo. And of course the rivers are now covered with expressways uh, so that the whole uh, basic frameful integrity, the formful source of that place called Tokyo has long since been swallowed up. It's just a big urban concentration. Then you get this kind of thing that, uh, that many architects are pleased with, you know, these clever little trinket buildings that, uh, that don't ever intend to become compositional parts of anything, and they stand out there in their clever arrogance and unfortunately are called architecture. I was intrigued by this building, I know you've seen it in the magazine, uh, those round windows and that fan-shaped uh, shade in the window. That's so delicate and so Japanese. And obviously this thing was done by a talented person, but uh, talent not well spent in the framework of urban design. Uh, nice experimental uh, fooling around. Tange is is clearly a genius. This uh, doesn't seem to me to be a very efficient building, about four offices and tremendous uh, central stack. It's another tangy building. It was built for uh, one of the world's fairs. It's a uh, skating or hockey rink, uh, and, and the, the building is, is really a, a national treasure, but the Japanese have no sense of, uh, of maintenance of these kinds of buildings, and uh, the, the place is in fantastic disrepair, and it's not all that old. This is typical of uh, downtown Tokyo, private residence and uh, office tower existing side by side, which in, in some ways is charming. Uh, There's just a little uh, entrance to one of the office buildings. But this is Tokyo, this uh, uh, in, in the central portion of the picture is, is the Emperor's Palace and, the, and this, uh, this huge estate with a summer palace and a winter palace. It moves a quarter of a mile uh, to change residences, but this murky uh, air pollution is Tokyo. Tokyo should not be where it is. It's uh, it's in a place like Los Angeles that shouldn't have a city in it. And uh, it's hard to see how how life can be sustained in Tokyo. Uh, I had an enchanting time there, but uh, chemically, it's a tough place to live. Well, the, the Japanese, you'll see a lot of Japanese doing that, uh, but that's more for uh, prevention of contagion from germs and colds and things like that. Uh, a mask wouldn't really uh, filter out the, uh, the pollutants in that air. You can cut that air. Uh, this again, sort of a, a, a different sense of, uh, of uh, composition and uh, almost uh, the chaos of non-order. And uh, there was uh, the frame of an orderly uh, beginning to Tokyo that has been uh, long since overwhelmed. And of course, that energy continues to express itself and uh, express itself negatively on a community that didn't recognize its frame. <coughs> this is Kyoto. Uh, Kyoto is a lovely city. But this is its downtown. This is its urban design. Kyoto is uh, uh, a 
again, a precious kind of thing to have in its traditional uh, residential low-scale uh, past. But this kind of schlock Kyoto with Coca-Cola signs and, and a German building here and an English pub there and whatnot, it's, it's really a wild scene. And it's not Japanese and it's not anything else. It's sort of a, a mishmash. I thought this was fun. This is a Japanese lantern store where you go buy these things. It costs you about $30, $40. About $100 for one of those big ones. They're just sort of heavy to bring back. And this is so typical of Kyoto. Uh, this silver gray uh, roof tile. And this beautiful uh, uh, use of wood. It's kind of cypress, most of it, and uh, it's not finished, and the gradation is expressed uh, and so much revered by people in Japan and in Kyoto. You may not know that the, that the Japanese have a custom of, of declaring people to be national treasures. And this was a sculptor's residence, a potter's residence that I was taken to, and uh, uh, we had tea with him. And he has been since uh, he was recognized as a genius in his uh, earlier uh, years. He has been a national treasure and supported and subsidized by the Japanese government so that he never has to work. He is free to express his genius in his pottery. That's a, that's a beautiful uh, kind of understanding uh, in that attitude toward uh, people of talent. And this is up above Kyoto. Uh, you may look over on the right-hand side and see uh, that bamboo uh, skeleton that uh, they are training that tree to grow to a specific form. Though the forms of all those trees in all those gardens is a recorded form that has been that way for centuries in most cases. And when the typhoons uh, come through each year and cause so much damage, they go to the place where they grow these trees and uh, bring one in that has been grown to be exact, to exactly replicate the previous tree. Uh, or they put a tree in and uh, build a uh, framework that is cut to the specifications that that tree must have uh, so that the ancestors can rest in peace. Now notice how you, uh, you go up to that temple, uh, but not on the center line. There's a deference there, uh, a reticence that is so peculiarly Japanese. Uh, it's not a design style, it's the culture that you're looking at. very, very famous pedestrian street in, uh, in Kyoto. It's called Potter's Way. Uh, just many scale pedestrian shops. Uh, and a, uh, a very careful curvilinearity to that street. Uh, the mystery and the shadow and the anticipation of what's around the next bend. And the river itself. This is the river where they wash the silk. They dye the silk and wash it in the river. You must have seen pictures of that. And, uh, and this reinforcing uh, uh, collection of artist residences uh, adjacent and parallel to the river. And again, uh, entering uh, Rio Anji and that careful deference uh, off to the side kind of thing uh, that is so peculiar to Japan. The Rioanji itself. This is so expressive of the of the visual simplicity and actual complexity that is is uh, a sound and eloquent principle in design. Uh, you must go to Rioanji. You must at least read about it. 
one of the most compelling and overwhelming spaces I've ever been in. I, I, I couldn't even begin to guess at the dimensions it affects you so. Everything is, of course, uh, according to gender, and there's a male stone and a female stone. And uh, one of the stones uh, has only uh, a few inches of its bulk above the surface, and it indicates the, the uh, complexity of the human that is more under the surface than above. This is just a pond outside of Rio Anji. You can see uh, in the right center how that uh, tree is being reinforced. Uh, and you can see on the skyline, uh, one of the delightful things that they do is they manage their skylines. And all those trees have been pruned and, and uh, spaced and open uh, to give you that delicate tracery of uh, closed and then open uh, uh, transitions on the skyline. Uh, it's nice to have all that free labor from the monks. Ah, and here's Hong Kong. As spectacular and beautiful a harbor as uh, any that I could possibly imagine. And, and the harbor at any one point is, uh, is going 100 miles an hour. And there's aircraft carriers and sampans and junks and uh, speedboats and people water skiing and ferries running back and forth to Kowloon. It is, uh, uh, it is a, a scene that is constantly dominated by any one of these buildings uh, on the slopes uh, of Hong Kong Island. Uh, just a, a, an engaging place of tremendous, compelling power. And this is also Hong Kong. Aberdeen, just adjacent to Hong Kong, around the other side of the island. It's really there, folks. Now, let me just make one or two uh, <coughs> closing comments. I've, I've made the effort to make the points that I've uh, intended to. In the, in the older environments that I've experienced and, and attempted to uh, illustrate for you here through photographs, and, and photographs don't, of course, do the places justice, and certainly not my photographs, but all of these places are characterized first of all by limitation and limitation kept these places in reference to their landscape frame limitation the inability to overwhelm the place kept the compositional design of the place in reference to its natural frame that was one of the most fortuitous periods in history that we've had the period without power and what limitation in the absence of power didn't cause than tradition caused, or taboo, or beliefs and superstition, or the aristocracy, or the tastemakers. Uh, and, and what we've witnessed in the last few years, and really almost within the frame of reference of your life, life, lifetimes, is a collapse of all of these institutions, and a rise in the capacity, or the absurd uh, uh, misunderstanding of the opportunity for power. And because we have power, we tend to use it. And of course, in using it, we tend to abuse it. Now it's time for us to forget this nonsense about power. And it's time for us to forget the fact that because we have bulldozers, we should push things around. That was idiotic to begin with, and it's even worse now. And of course, our whole, uh, our whole sense of environment, our visual sense of what we build is based upon a conceptual sense of power that is out of date with the world. And if we don't change our minds about power, our minds are going to be changed for us. We've got to stop this, uh, this foolish uh, abuse and waste, and uh, we are going to stop it. And we're going to stop it uh, in many ways before your children are born and in all ways before uh, you're no longer with us. And you might just as well incorporate the reality of the world in the work you do in this world. And the reality of this world denies 
a lack of compositional substance and compositional interrelationship and, and, and vital experience caused by you out of an understanding of people and place. difficult one. Uh, uh, the, the clash of cultures in this regard is a hard thing to, uh, I don't know as we're awakening to traditional Eastern values. I think we're awakening to values that we have always had and not appreciated and not recognized. Uh, and, and I'm clearly aware of the fact that either it doesn't make any difference whether we awaken to it or not, we're going to have that power to work with. We are not going to have the opportunity for continued extravagant ways. And of course we are, we are, uh, our whole experience is of a, a misdesigned environmental ethic. Uh, we design a fractured one-to-one -one collection of simple entities called buildings. We don't design an environment. Uh, we uh, respond to the internal program, uh, functional energies of this thing called a building. Uh, and, and then we stick it on the ground some goddamn place. And if it happens to have windows facing the west, then we air condition the building. And, uh, We've just got to stop this nonsense of making a mistake because we know we can solve the problem with the uh, increased use of external power. Uh, we've, we've, um, we've got an accidental sense of place. And the only time we recognize place and really accord it any particular sympathy and respect is when it overwhelms us like Yosemite does. But when it's subtle and delicate, when it's a Muncie type place, uh, we are very much likely to step all over it and not, not understand it, not, not, not expand the subtleties of it so that we can have the opportunity to, to celebrate those subtleties. Uh, anybody can appreciate a Yosemite. Uh, you ought to be able to work on the expansion of the subtleties are delicate, beautiful simplicities of a place like Muncie. But you got practice that doesn't come easy. And you're not doing any good with all your damn cars. Yeah. Oh, no, no, no. I, no, I don't think we'll educate ourselves to that point. I think we'll just uh, run out of the capacity. We'll run out of the desire to afford to pay will run out of the ability to uh, go to the store to buy what we want because it won't be in the store. Uh, and we'll run out of the, uh, the capacity to continue exponentially to have more and more and more to maintain uh, this, this grotesque kind of lifestyle that we have. Uh, and that will change it. We won't, uh, we won't do this willingly. And we certainly won't educate ourselves to this. Oh, sure, we'll, we'll respond to crisis, uh, and we won't respond until it's crisis, and we won't respond really until the crisis is going around for the third or fourth time. Uh, but we won't do it. We'll be forced to, I'm sure, not, uh, not voluntarily. Thank you for being so patient. Thank you for having me here.